This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Acts, starting at chapter 1. I invite you to pull out your pew Bibles, and as our children will be reading theirs, I invite you to read yours right now on page 884. It's Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 15. And this is the point in Acts where Jesus has been with the believers for 40 days after his resurrection and then he ascends out of their sight and this passage begins. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Picking up at 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Happy Mother's Day. I am so grateful to be able to preach here again. For over 30 years, this has been my church home with all the complications and connections that the word home implies. And I'm also grateful for this very odd piece of scripture that is today's lectionary text. It can't be coincidence. You may wonder why I say this is an odd bit of scripture. Well, first, it takes place in a kind of wilderness time. In those days, the writer of Acts says, those days being the 10 days between the ascension of Jesus to heaven and Pentecost. Ascension day was last Thursday, and Pentecost is a week from today. (coughs) These are the 10 odd days which end the Easter season and before the Holy Spirit gives birth to the church at Pentecost. We call it the Easter season, but Jesus has gone, and the Holy Spirit has not yet arrived. It's 10 days, not 40 days or 40 years, which we usually think of as wilderness time, but surely the followers of Jesus were anxious, uncertain, wondering what was next. Jesus was missing, even though they knew where he had gone. So the text says about 120 followers of Jesus are waiting and praying in the upper room in Jerusalem, including the 11 remaining disciples, as well as, the text says, certain women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, so this is all well and good because Acts 1-4 says Jesus had ordered, ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Stay and wait because something amazing is going to happen soon, 
not now, soon. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not water, like John used. His last words to them before he ascended to the Father, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. They were ordered to wait for the gift, and waiting was hard. Someone was missing. To me, this sounds a bit like the time we're in here and now at the corner of Pondfield and Midland. We're waiting. Waiting for a senior minister, waiting for a process to play itself out, waiting for healing, waiting for a gift of the Holy Spirit which we know we need though we may not be able to envision exactly what it will do for us. But it's so hard to wait when someone is missing. That crowd in the upper room was likely anxious, impatient, frightened, on hold, arguably the worst place in which to find oneself. And the book of Acts doesn't tell us much about what went on during this time. We're told they prayed and waited and prayed and waited and prayed some more. And Peter couldn't stand it anymore. Peter is so often the disciple who does not get it. He's impatient with waiting. After all, Jesus has promised baptism by the Holy Spirit, not water. Jesus says, wait for the gift and you will be on fire. You will be prepared to be the witnesses to the ends of the earth. But in the midst of the waiting and the praying, Peter looks around and says, someone's missing. Peter says, while we're waiting, let's replace Judas. Judas? How would we go about replacing Judas? What qualities would we want, given how badly the whole Judas thing played out? He's well-intentioned enough. Peter knows that Jesus called 12 disciples because Jesus was reconstituting the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. The 12 of Jesus were supposed to be the new leadership of Israel, and there was a vacancy. One thing Peter is clear about, the replacement needs to be someone who has been with them the whole time, not some new up-and-comer. Nope, we need someone with a history, someone we already know, someone like us. So Peter decides that instead of waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit, we'll just pick someone. Surely we can just do that while we're waiting. And somehow they come up with two names, Matthias and Joseph, a.k.a. Barsabbas, a.k.a. Justice. They may have been there from the beginning, but the gospel writers never mentioned them. Do either of them seem like a logical next step? And is a roll of the dice a good idea? How does that gamble work out for them? They roll the dice, it comes up Matthias, and he is added to the 12. Okay, so now, no one's missing. Except that we never hear another word about Matthias. We are told nowhere in the Bible that he was a great addition. But here's the other thing. The man who was not chosen, the man with three names, Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice, we don't hear about him either by any of those names. There was a funny little note in the margin of my study Bible that said, no one ever casts lots again in the Bible. From this point on, everyone relies on the Holy Spirit. Well, that's the point. Peter couldn't wait, did not wait, felt the need to do something while they were waiting, so the group went ahead, rolled the dice, 
chose between what we would have to say were two questionable choices, and neither one, chosen, not chosen, is ever heard from again. If you're like me, you wonder, why is this story in our lectionary? There were plenty of Jesus' followers, including those who were not part of the 12, who go on to do great things, important things. Think of Paul, think of Stephen. And when it's reported that some of the other 12 die, they were not replaced. This passage might suggest that whether or not we are chosen, we might be among the ones never heard from again. This passage might also suggest that if we don't wait for the Holy Spirit's guidance, we might make a poor decision. But let's remember the truest thing of our Reformed faith. It's not about us, after all. It's about God, God's timing, God's grace, God's purpose, God using us to do God's work. Whether we admit it or recognize it, whether we are eager or hesitant, the Spirit can move us, and there we are, on the way, following the one who has called us. Ready or not, we are to be of use. My uh, sister gave me a book I treasure, if only for the title. The book's called God Uses Cracked Pots, and I am the visual aid. <laughs> the greatest comfort for me is that God calls and equips some pretty strange and unlikely characters to do God's work in the world. And some are famous, and most are quite ordinary. The quiet saints who keep on doing the tasks put in front of them with humility, grace, and persistence. I've spent a lot of the last two years thinking about church leadership because I was sure that someone might be missing. I served on the former search committee talking to so many talented pastors who would have loved to have been chosen for our team here. And I've also, more, much more recently, been grieving too many missing saints, people who were the church to me. Indulge me, I have two quick stories. During all the time it took me to finish seminary, the one person, maybe even the only person, who asked me about my studies each and every time that I saw her was Chris Eldridge. Not the pastors at that time, not my contemporaries. Chris made me feel like I was doing an important and meaningful thing when I suspect that most of my family and friends thought I was crazy. Chris is missing in my life and in our church. And even before that, when I was new to church leadership, I was sitting on the mission council Wright Elliott spent 45 minutes on the phone with me explaining how things work here at the church. He helped me understand what I needed to do to get the proposal before me acted on. He was probably younger then than I am now. And he was an important man with a big day job. And this was a work day, and he gave me 45 minutes to help me, yes but to help the church. I remember that I was so grateful at the time, but now looking back, I see that his investment of time in me was to get church work done, and it was pure grace. Wright Elliott is missing in my life and in our church. And I wonder who are our next pillars who will support this congregation? What have we done to raise up a new generation of wise and grace-filled leaders? Are we waiting for the Holy Spirit to call them, 
or are we going to roll the dice and pick our own? There are some here, but some are missing. The fact is, Jesus, Jesus did order the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait because the Holy Spirit is coming and you will have that gift to help you move forward. But the other fact is that we are impatient people. We think we know better and we don't like to wait. We want to be back on the road, moving forward, doing God's work. And if you think you have heard more questions than answers this morning, well, that's exactly where I find myself. So here's where I stand after all the questions and confusion and disappointments. There is nothing and no one we should be waiting for. We've been told what to do. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the prisoner, comfort the sick, free the oppressed, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. We have all the job description that we need and enough work for a billion lifetimes. And we affirm that we have already been given the gift of the Holy Spirit at our baptism. The waiting need not paralyze us. The waiting is where the work begins. We may have started out badly, made a hash of the search and of some of this interim time, but many, maybe even most of us, are still going about the business of being the church, the body of Christ, God's hands and feet in the world while we are waiting. We have continued to educate our children in the lessons of faith. We have sent our young people to different cultures to learn about what service is. We have welcomed and graduated formerly incarcerated folks and helped them build a new community. We have glorified God in music and song. We have raised money with cast off clothing and household items and we will put that to use to help build the kingdom of God here on earth. We have welcomed the newly baptized and will affirm the soon to be confirmed. We diligently care for our frail and vulnerable members. We have celebrated the lives of our saints who have gone to God and we ha have comforted those who grieve. And our three gifted pastors have preached the word of God with grace and power, celebrated the sacraments, the holy days, and lived their calls, serving the people of God faithfully in this beloved community of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a waiting time, and there is preparation time. Most of us came to a life of faith because rather ordinary people told us the story of Jesus. We are about the business of preparing for what comes next. Do not lose heart. Some of us are missing, but the rest of us are still here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.